Good night, happy Sabbath. One of my favorite songs is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Uh, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Isn't it a wonderful blessing to be a child of God? Uh, oftentimes, we bear burdens and uh, we carry uh, various problems because we didn't give it to Jesus. Amen? But I'm so thankful for Jesus. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to save us. We thank you that we can be here tonight to pray, to worship you, to hear your word. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight. Lord, I pray that you will be with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, the story is told of a woman that was caught. And the title of uh, our sermon tonight is, As He Sees Us. As He Sees Us. Now, the Bible tells us in John chapter 8 that... In John chapter 8, verse 2, that early in the morning, early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So Jesus was in a teaching mode in the temple. The Bible says that the night before, he, he, uh, he was in the Mount of Olives, and then early in the morning, he went into the temple to teach the people. And the Bible says in John chapter 8, uh, verse 3, that while Jesus was teaching, that the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, verse 4, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? What is their question? What do you say? Tonight, I would like to encourage you that it's not so much about what others say. It is not so much about what I say it's more about what Jesus says. That was a good question. That was a very good question. Now in verse 6, the Bible says, This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. See, friends, Jesus sometimes has selective hearing. Matthew 
Many times when we are faced with certain circumstances, the certain situations, and Jesus sees and he hears, there are times when he pretends that he doesn't see or that he does not hear, but Jesus is up to something very special. Now, verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now, if, if you go down to verse 12, if you go down to verse 12 of chapter 8, the Bible says, that then Jesus spoke to them. That this is at the end of the story. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see, friends, what Jesus is doing here is that Jesus is presenting himself as the light of the world. In other words, the woman is coming into the presence of light. She is coming out of darkness into what? Into marvelous light. And you see, the light of God is illustrated oftentimes in the wisdom of Jesus. Just the way that Jesus deals with situations. Just the way that deal, Jesus deals with people. Just the way that Jesus deals with sin is, is a miracle. I would like to remind us tonight that if you want to see miracles, it's not just about somebody getting healed. If you want to see miracles, open your Bible. Open your Bible and just listen to the Word of God, the thoughts of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God, the, the salvation of God. It's a miracle. It's miraculous. The Word of God is power. It's miraculous power. And so the Bible says in John chapter 8 uh, that in, ver in John chapter 8 verse 8 and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground Then those who heard it being convicted of their conscience went out by uh, one by one with the uh, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in her midst. Notice who left first, the oldest, and then the, then the last. You see, we as adults need to understand that we are very influential. Very influential. What we do, others will follow. Older students, we're talking about seniors. What you do, Others will follow. You have that great influence. And so Jesus wrote, uh, uh, began to write with his fingers in the dust, and then they began to leave. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, what did he say to her? Go to John chapter 8, verse 10. Jesus said to her, he said what? Woman. Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Then John chapter 8, verse 11 says, Jesus said, No one, Lord. She said, rather, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her these precious words. What did he say? He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Notice, my friends, that she was caught, she was labeled, and she was condemned by others as a terrible sinner. There are times in our lives when we make mistakes. And God does not label sins uh, the way we do. But there are times in our lives when we make big mistakes, little mistakes. But when we find ourselves at the feet of Jesus, we need to be listening not to condemnation. We need to be listening not to the voice of the world. We need to be listening to the voice of Jesus. Amen? 
the woman was left at the feet of Jesus and, 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 and she was hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to her, what's most important in your life is what Jesus is saying to you today. We need to pay attention to Jesus because he is the light of the world. The Bible says that the world is in darkness, but Jesus is the light. But the Bible also says that we are the what? We are the light of the world. We are to pattern Jesus. We are to reflect his light even in the way that we treat others and even in the way that we think and act. But notice, my friends, that Jesus is very balanced. Jesus, in the end, did not condemn her. Yes, he made it clear that she had sinned. She was guilty. Jesus did not condemn her, but Jesus did not condone. In other words, Jesus said to her, go and sin no more. Come as you are, but I would like to take you to a certain destination, and that destination is heaven. Amen? In John chapter 8, in review, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? He said, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not condemn her or label her. He did not labor her according to what the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to orchestrate. Uh, um, uh, uh, there's a quote. It says, Christ, Christ looks. Christ does what? Christ looks, upon, Christ looks upon souls not as they are in themselves. Not as they what? Christ looks upon souls not as they are in themselves, but as they may be if they will surrender themselves to him in sincerity as did the thief on the cross. As we begin a new journey, as we begin a new journey this year, we need to understand the way that Christ sees us. Amen? And the way that Christ sees us will determine how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. The way that Christ sees us will, 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 will affect our plans and our aims and our objectives for the future. As we move forward into the new year, God's desire is not for us to be depressed. God's desire for us is not to have negative thinking, but God wants us to think positively according to His love for us. According to what? His love for us. Recently, I was reading a book by Neil Nedley, medical doctor, it's called The Lost Art of Positive Thinking. And friends, I believe that a lot of people today, young people, older people, are suffering from mental health issues. And in this book, Dr. Neil Nedley lists a, uh, some common mislabels. Mislabel number one, you're such a messy person. Miss label number two, you must be the world's most disorganized person. You are so selfish. You quits. And this word is, is actually in the dictionary, and it means, it means what it means. You'll see. You're such a big baby. Jerk. It sounds bad, doesn't it? It really does. 
But in this book, Dr. Neem Lilly makes a suggestion. He says, he says, okay, let's do what we call phrase replacement therapy. What can we do? Okay, instead of, instead of saying you're a messy person, what should we say? It's important to keep your room clean and tidy. Instead of saying that you must be the world's most disorganized person, try saying you could save a lot of time if you improve your organizational skills. Doesn't that sound nice? You know, today I was having a, a talk with my son, and I, 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 I was putting in practice some of these principles, and, and, and I, it really worked. I said to him, it would help if you would do so and so. It would benefit you so much if you did so and so. And he said, huh, yes, Dad. <laughs> It was a positive response. And as I, and as I began to, to practice this new art of replacement therapy, I began to think of how many times I have said the wrong things. And how comforting and healing it is when we speak positively, and instead of using labels of condemnation, we use positive phrases that can be of an encouragement. Instead of call, instead of instead of uh, in, instead of um, uh, uh, calling person uh, uh, very selfish, you are so selfish. Why not say generosity is a trait to be cultivated? Generosity is a trait to be cultivated. Why not say, could you please be a little bit more careful? Uh, instead of saying you're a big baby. Why not uh, say, I'll be glad when you act more maturely? <laughs> Amen? Amen? I just can't imagine some teachers <laughs> saying this, and some parents, and some husbands and wives. Amen? <laughs> Your consideration for others could use a little improvement. Amen? What a great God we serve. Amen. What a great God. We serve. Let me read for you from uh, the book Lost of Art Thinking uh, under the heading An Ancient Example of Labeling Correctly. An Ancient Example of Labeling Correctly. God is not afraid to call errors by their right name. And that often involves using labels. Significant mistakes are called sin. False churches are labeled as Babylon. And the devil is labeled as the father of lies. These labels, which had relevant parallels, were helpful to people who wanted to rise above the prevailing deception. But while God uses instructional, accurate labels, labels, he is also in the business of correcting inaccurate labels. The woman caught in adultery and dragged to people from judgment, for judgment rather, had been labeled a sinner, worthy of death, by the people who surrounded her that day. Jesus knew she was a sinner. Jesus knew what? She was a sinner. But he also knew that in her heart, she really wanted to do what? She really wanted to do better. He knew she had been enticed into sin and then dragged into public humiliation by the very same ones who framed her in the first place. Though Jesus did not labor her, label her activity as though Jesus did label her activity as sin, he spared her from the full consequence, full consequences of accurately, by accurately labeling her accusers similar sinful activities. Centuries later, Jesus would take a humiliating walk through the Kidron Valley and up to the mountain of the Mount of Olives, another king, this time 
innocent and undeserving, would be the victim of name-calling, scourging, spitting, slaps, and abuse. He became sin for us, taking our, taking, taking our sinner's label so that we could have life in him and receive the label of adopted sons and daughters of God. Children of the heavenly kingdom, he labels us as his family. He labels us as what? As his family members and, and is not ashamed to call us brethren. Amen? He's not ashamed to call us what? Brethren. And that's why that motivated Paul, that motivated Christ being unashamed to call us brethren, motivated Paul to say, I am not ashamed of what? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? Power of God unto salvation. To the Jews first, and then to the what? To the Gentiles. Jesus is not ashamed of us. And so we ought not to be ashamed of him and of the gospel. Amen? This should shape this should shape the way we think of ourselves, the way we think of others, and it should motivate us to help others. Amen? Positive thinking. Positive. A positive example, uh, Neil Nedley writes, a positive example of labeling can be found in the story of the Garden of Eden. When God asked Adam to label or to name all of the animals... Do you remember that? Another would be when Christians were labeled as such because they acted or wanted to act like Christ. Throughout history, he has taken people with negative labels, such as Rahab, the harlot, and given her new life, hope, and meaning. Some of them he labeled with new names, like like Jacob. Jacob became what? Israel. Abram, Abram became what? Abraham. S uh, Simon became Peter. And Saul became Paul. Amen? But most will have to wait like the rest of us. Most will have to wait like the rest of us until we reach the new Jerusalem. Until we reach where? the New Jerusalem, to receive a new and accurate label, the Bible says, to him that overcometh. To him that what? To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manner and will give him a white stone. We'll give him what? We'll give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now that is a label to look forward to. Amen? We ought to treat ourselves and treat others according to God's labels, according to God's promises, according to the hope that God has set before us. Amen? The practice of laboring, of labeling, rather, itself is not always wrong. Both positive and negative labels are used in the Bible. Correct labeling can be a good practice if the label is accurate. If the label is what? If the label is accurate, helpful, and instructional. Now let's, in closing... Look at some practical tips, some practical tips for, some practical strategies for success. Practical strategies for success were suggested by Dr. Nedley. Tip number one. Tip number one, cultivate an atmosphere of respect. Cultivate an atmosphere of what? Respect. Number two, be a model of respectful behavior. Number three, explain to others 
why name-calling is harmful. Number four, avoid name-calling as entertainment. Number five, correct or walk away. Correct or what? Walk away. And number six, keep track of your, of your progress. Keep track of your progress. If mislabeling is a major problem for you, write down your slip-ups and victories. Keeping track is really the only way to know you are making progress as you seek to reframe your thinking. As you seek to do what? To reframe your thinking. You see, the gospel is practical. The gospel is what? The gospel is practical. And I believe that there are times when we need to start thinking practically and doing practical things to help ourselves to begin to, to think and to act. And as a matter of fact, to, 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 to receive the gift of grace. Amen? The Bible is highly practical. The Bible tells us that we are in a great controversy, a great controversy. And this great controversy is a controversy that is, is a battle. It's a what? And this battle is not fought with sticks or stones, is not fought with swords and, and bombs and missiles and missiles. This battle is a battle for the mind. It's a battle for the mind. And the only safety is right thinking. The only safety is right thinking. And that's why the Bible says we should gird up the loins of our mind. In Colossians 3, verse 16, 17, the Bible says, May the word of God dwell in you what? richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Colossians 3, verse 16, 17. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Singing what? Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. God has provided a way by which we can have positive thinking, by which we can have the mind of Christ in a practical way. We can overcome, amen? We can be victors in this warfare through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, and through the help of Jesus. And in this great controversy, the battle is a battle for the mind, and it's a battle between Christ and the devil. And what the devil does, the devil fights with words. He fights with what? He fights with words. I was reading, I was reading uh, a book called Desire of Ages, and Desire of Ages says that before Jesus came into this world, the, the uh, satanic agencies took full control of the human, the human agent. It says that the senses and the organs of men were worked by demonic powers, so much so that they the, the, the human being, all, all elements of the human being just responded to demonic forces. Satan works the senses. He works the organs. He works the eyes. He works the feelings. He works everything. But the Bible says, the Bible says, when the Spirit of God takes control of your life, God takes full control of your being. Amen? Remember the story of Peter. Apostle Peter. Peter was an angry man. Peter was a self-confident person. Quick to speak. Slow to listen. Uh, he was a uh, it was a son of thunder, right? Thunderous. But, but, but when Peter surrendered his life to Jesus, when Peter surrendered his life to Jesus, what happened? When he surrendered his life to Jesus, he was totally transformed by God. Saul of Tarsus, 
was on his way to condemn and to kill. He was angry with the Jews. But when he met Jesus, what happened? When he met Jesus, he was totally changed. His mind, his senses, his every, every aspect of his being, his nerves, everything was just moving in Jesus. That's salvation. This woman, this woman was at the feet of Jesus and she was in abject humiliation, abject penitence. She was crying. She was weeping. She did not know what, what the end of the story would be like. But the Bible tells us that she had a positive experience. Jesus forgave her. Jesus blessed her and he sent her forward into the future to be a blessing. Tonight, Jesus is in the temple. Amen? You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus is still with us. He is in the temple. I believe that he is here in this temple tonight. And he is speaking to us. He is teaching the word of God. And, and I believe that he has a vision for your future. Amen? Amen? And Jesus, I believe, is trying to tell me, he's trying to tell you, do not listen to the crowd. Do not listen to the devil. Do not listen to to the voice of hopelessness. Do not listen to the distractions. But the time is, is, is now that we should listen to the voice of Jesus. Amen? When every other voice is hushed, we can hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us. And he speaks words of hope. Jesus is not concerned anymore with your past. Jesus is not concerned anymore with your labels. Jesus is concerned with who you are in him. Amen? Those who like this woman understand that they are sinners, understand that they are hopeless without Jesus, without pride, without self uh, uh, self-exaltation comes to Jesus uh, 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 open and honest about, 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 about their sins. Those who come to Jesus like this woman will find full and free salvation and in the final judgment they will be saved. Amen? In closing, let's go back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying what? I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have but what? But shall have, have the light, but have the, the what? The light of life. Tonight I submit to you that Jesus is the light of the world. And he wants to lead your future. But not only does he want to give you light, but he also wants you to be the light of the world. The Bible says that what? You are the what? Light of the world, a city set on a hill... What? Baba says we should not hide our lamp under the bushel. Once we have received forgiveness, once we have received the blessings of Christ, we should go forth to share his light with others. Share with our friends. Share with our families. Share with the entire world. We should be a positive influence, not a negative influence. We should not go about labeling others, labeling ourselves, but we should speak positive words to others. Speak positive words about ourselves. Speak positive words about Jesus. 
and allow the Spirit of God to use us to bless others. Amen? This is my encouragement for you tonight. If it is your desire, if it is your desire to live, to think, as Jesus sees you, raise your hand with me. Secondly, if it is your desire to treat others as Jesus sees them, a show of hands. And if it is your desire this year, this Sabbath, this week, to walk with Jesus in the light, I invite you to kneel with me as we pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you so loved us that you came to save us. You did not label us. You did not condemn. The Bible says in, 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 in John 3, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 70, that we are condemned when we do not believe. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the balanced way that you, you, you see us and the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to listen to the voice of hope, the voice of Jesus, and to live our lives according to Jesus. Father, I pray for each individual here tonight, for each listener online, I pray that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to live in the light and to be the light of the world. We thank you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.